Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and a special uh, thank you to Dr. Berman and, and Patricia Stroh for inviting me to be here today. It is a real privilege and very humbling to have an opportunity to be here to see these amazing artifacts in this beautiful exhibit. And I should probably share with you how it is that I became smitten, if you will, by Alexander Wheelock Thayer. So roughly about 20 or 21 years ago, when I was a fledgling doctoral student at Kent State University, I was taking an advanced writing and research seminar. And the professor, who happens to be our next guest speaker, Dr. Theodore Albrecht, said, we must write a 30 page plus paper at the end of the semester and we must use primary source material. So I started looking at Dwight's Journal of Music and reading and, and I finally decided, oh, I'm gonna write a paper tracing the evolution of the first performances of Bach's St. Matthew Passion in the United States in Boston. I began to see all of these articles in Dwight's Journal of Music and they were signed AWT. And I couldn't figure out who is this person. These articles are fascinating. <laughs> Dr. Albrecht, I keep coming across these really interesting articles by an AWT. And his eyes got this big. And he said, oh, he said, that's Alexander Wheelock Thayer. That's Beethoven's principal biographer. You know, we don't know much about him. You should look into him. <laughs> and so, a doctoral dissertation, and 20 years later, <laughs> I am here at the Beethoven Center <laughs> to present some of my research for you. Yes, I've been working on Thayer now for over 20 years, and I was telling uh, Patricia uh, yesterday, I know I should finish this book, and I know I need to get it done and get it out there, but there is a part of me that hopes it never comes to an end, because I'm just having so much fun with it. But anyways, let me share just a little bit of what I have discovered about this incredible, fascinating individual. In 1901, Amy M.M. M. Graham, writing for the Chicago-based monthly magazine Music, described Alexander Wheelock Thayer, the revered biographer of Beethoven, as, quote, one who has done more than any other American in the field of musical biography and one whom all Americans should be glad to honor, end quote. Similarly, the London Musical Times in its September 1st, 1897 obituary of Thayer concluded that he, quote, laid the entire musical world under the deepest obligation, end quote. More recently, that is to say 35 years ago, Robert Stevenson in his pioneering article American musical scholarship, John Rowe Parker to Thayer, characterized the latter as, quote, towering head and shoulders above er every American musical scholar of his century, end quote. The primary source material for this study is Dwight's Journal of Music, a paper of art and literature, published at Boston from 1852 to 1881. Thayer began writing for Dwight's Journal from its inception, and was, with the exception of the editor himself, John Sullivan Dwight, its most prolific contributor. From Thayer's numerous articles, concert reviews, and other notices, it is possible to place his whereabouts, at times even daily, during this roughly eight-month period. Beyond this, Thayer's contributions to Dwight's journal constitute a brilliant synthesis of travel writing, general history, and music criticism and provide hitherto unknown biographical information concerning the writer himself. Today we are going to start in Bamberg, and Thayer is going to move to Frankfurt, then to Mainz, then Koblenz, and to Bonn, the birthplace of Beethoven. From Bamberg on August 6, Thayer traveled by railroad to Frankfurt, there taking a room at the Stadt Darmstadt Inn. A busy week here, reported Thayer's editor, John Sullivan Dwight. The forenoons mostly with Schindler, the biographer of Beethoven. Indeed, two or three afternoons also. These long, interesting, and exciting conversations confirmed the visitor in the opinion at different times recorded in the journal that the so much abused Schindler, however much mistaken in many minor points in his book, 
owing to insufficient data and to errors in correspondence, is a perfectly honest writer, and fired with the love and veneration for Beethoven's memory, which seems to increase with advancing age. For Schindler is now a man of 65 years. He has a good memory, for he recognized Thayer, his visitor of 1854, and inquired about other Americans whom he had seen at various times. I should interject here that Thayer first interviewed Schindler on October 19 and 20, 1854. And it was immediately after this first interview that he rushed back to Berlin. And on November 1st, 1854, began his first examination of Beethoven's conversation books, which we're going to hear much more about from Professor Albrecht later. But it's my feeling that in this first interview with Schindler, that Schindler made him aware of these books, where they were deposited, because they are immediately made his way back to Berlin and started his own examination. So the, the interview that we're talking about here is actually the second interview that Thayer had with Schindler, and the last actually. At an unspecified time in mid to late August, Thayer departed Mainz, uh, Frankfurt for Mainz, from whence he traveled by steamboat down the Rhine, stopping for one night in Koblenz. On the boat, I met Karl Forms, reported Thayer to Dwight, who must now be with you again, for he told me that he was to sail for America on the 1st of September. So it's fantastic, right? He's traveling down the Rhine by steamboat, and he just happens to run into one of the most distinguished singers of the whole of the 19th century, and they strike up a conversation. And since he had already heard him twice in concert, there was some context for their conversation. And this is Thayer's life. During the course of Thayer's brief layover in Koblenz, he visited with Dr. Julius Stefan Wegler, the son of Beethoven's close friend, Dr. Franz Gerhard Wegler, who had practiced medicine there. The next day, Thayer again boarded a steamboat and favored by the swift current continued down the Rhine to Bonn, where he was quite happy, quote, to once again trod the narrow streets of his first German home. And what I love about this, uh, this is actually an advertisement for this particular hotel. And this just recently came uh, into the center's collection. And what I love about this is it shows the steamboats precisely the type of boat that Thayer himself would have traveled on moving up and down the Rhine River. Thayer passed his time in Bonn examining and copying, copying from old newspapers and court almanacs and in general searching for Beethoveniana. On September 15, he went to the hospital to interview the ailing Gottfried Fischer, who around 1838 began writing down his recollections of the Beethoven family together with those of his sister Cecilia. Fischer had intimate knowledge of the composer's family, who were longtime tenants in the house owned by his family. Also at Bonn, Thayer connected with his editor, John Sullivan Dwight, who had set out for Europe in July 1860 to spend a year traveling and studying music. Dwight made brief stays in England, France, and Switzerland before reaching Frankfurt, Germany on October 7. The two friends had decided to travel together up the Rhine to Mainz, from which they would part company, Dwight turning eastward to Berlin and Thayer turning westward to Paris. We went immediately on board the steamboat, which was already puffing and blowing, wrote Thayer. I have seldom, if ever, seen the Rhine so beautiful as on that day. Thayer proceeded from the landing dock to the Carp Inn, and after dinner he carefully planned his route to Paris. The diarist has gone up the Rhine and on to Paris and on the scent of certain Beethoven treasures to be found there, announced Dwight's Journal of Music, and we shall soon hear from him in the gay capital of France. On the morning of October 26, Thayer called on the American transcendentalist poet and artist Christopher Pierce Cranch, who had been in the French capital since 1853, pursuing a career as a painter. Thayer visited Cranch at his studio following the latter's return from Fontainebleau and afterwards reported on the artist's activities in Dwight's Journal of Music. 
Cranch has now nearly quite finished several pretty large pictures. Two are views of the mouth of the Grand Canal, Venice, one of which in particular has the brilliant glow of the Italian morning sky, and two are water and coast scenes in the Bay of Naples. He also has several new studies of trees and forest glades from Fontainebleau. So this painting was actually on Cranch's easel when Thayer visited him in, in his studio. It's fantastic. Moreover, Thayer uh, reported visiting the Cranch residence where he heard some very fine pianoforte playing by the young French pianist Mademoiselle Laure Colmoche, who performed, among other works, Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. On November 23, Thayer visited with the composer and virtuoso pianist Sigismund Talberg. He's going to Naples to my great disappointment, wrote Thayer, as this deprives me of the sight of many valuable manuscripts which I had hoped to examine, end quote. Talberg, who was present at the Kärntner Tor Theater for the, for, for the premiere of the Ninth Symphony in 1824, recounted the event to Thayer, including his recollection of Beethoven's performance attire. At the beginning of the new year, 1861, Thayer was still awaiting permission to examine the archival material related to Bonn. According to his friend, Franz Edward Goering, a musical literateur and critic for the Vienna Deutsche Zeitung, Thayer lost much time in suing for permission to examine the manuscripts, permission that was finally refused by Louis Napoleon's Minister of Foreign Affairs. Dismayed and disappointed, Thayer decided to depart Paris for London. On Tuesday, January 29, 1861, following a three and a half month residency in Paris, they arrived in London in search of Beethoveniana. When I left Victoria Station upon my arrival, the fog was so dense as to cut off all view of more than 10 or 12 houses at once, recalled Thayer. And the new language, English, was often put to use before I found the gentleman by whose advice and kindness I had been brought thither. The gentleman to whom Thayer refers was likely the eminent English music critic and author Henry Fothergill Chorley who provided the financial means for Thayer's researches in England. Chorley announced the Beethoven enthusiast's arrival in the Athenaeum. Mr. Thayer, the American gentleman who has been for years collecting materials for a life of Beethoven in all parts of the continent, is now in England with a view of making researches here. His gatherings, we believe, have been extensive and made with a scrupulous desire for accuracy. It would be only courteous and a real admirer of the music of Beethoven belonging to this country, who may have contributions in store, to afford this gentleman the opportunity of examining them. We shall be happy, in default of better means, to be the medium of communication with him. Almost immediately upon his arrival in England, Thayer began making researches. On January 30 and 31, he interviewed the English pianist, cellist, and composer Charles Neat, and in February met with the conductor and composer Sir George Smart, uh, as well as the English composer and pianist Cipriani Potter, all of whom were intimately acquainted with Beethoven in Vienna. In April, Thayer traveled to Bath, uh, where he interviewed the Bavarian tenor Josef Ruckel, who sang the role of Floristan in the new version of Leonora produced at the Theater an der Wien on March 29, 1806. When Thayer visited London in 1861, the English music dealer and publisher Christopher Lonsdale and his son and ultimate successor Robert Edward were in business at 26 Old Bond Street. And from both of these gentlemen, he received great kindness and valuable aid in his English researches. One can only imagine the Beethoven biographer's delight at the opportunity to interview Christopher Lonsdale, who prior to owning his own firm had served as principal assistant to the prominent British publisher and music dealer Robert Birchall. In 1815, Beethoven sold Birchall his own forte piano arrangement of Wellington Sieg, Anton Diabelli's forte piano reduction of the Seventh Symphony, the violin sonata in G major opus 96, and the forte piano trio in B-flat major, opus 97. For roughly two years, Birchall's health had prevented him from fully attending to his business. Consequently, it was Lonsdale who conducted all the correspondence with Beethoven in connection with these publications. Thayer also received assistance 
from the distinguished music critics George Hogarth and James William Davison, the English composer Sir George Alexander McFarren, and John Ella, the English violinist, conductor, and writer on music, who was founder and director of the Musical Union. It says, Dear Sir, your explanation greatly enhances the value of my autograph of the great maestro Beethoven. Finally, Thayer met the distinguished English music historian Sir George Grove, with whom he developed a close and enduring friendship. Thayer fondly recalled his first meeting with Grove, writing, I had the happiness to find not only a scholar and a gentleman, but a devoted admirer of Bach, Beethoven, Handel, Mozart, and the like. May 10, 1861. I delayed my departure from London, luckily, too, for my great object, as the delay gave me a mass of original letters of Beethoven to copy, which, although printed in part, if not completely, it was very important to me to see and copy for myself, so little reliance I find it to be placed on transcript as a rule made for the press. In the end, Thayer's London research residency was an unqualified success. It will interest many readers to hear the result of the researches in England made with a view of collecting Beethoven material by Mr. Thayer, wrote Chorley. The amount of correspondence, anecdote, verification of dates, of relics, and reminiscences which this country has yielded is understood to have surpassed expectation. We imagine Mr. Thayer's massive biographical materials to be more complete and copious than any gathered by former biographers. Writing under the diarist's pseudonym, the ever grateful Thayer published a thank you note in Dwight's Journal of Music toward the conclusion of his nearly six month stay in London in which he mentioned by name many of those from whom he had received valuable assistance. In conclusion, like the English music historian Dr. Charles Burney, Henry Edward Crabiel recalled in 1898, Thayer believed that intelligence as well as merchandise capable of adulteration is seldom genuine after passing through many hands and that it is always best to seek information at its source. He therefore sought out all of Beethoven's friends who were living in the sixth and seventh decades of the century, noted down their recollections of important occurrences in connection with the composer, and a multitude of incidents which might enable him to better to straighten out the thread of that life story which had been sadly tangled by the romancers who, under one pretense or another, were first in the field with books on Beethoven. To hear this from the lips of witnesses who are speaking from personal knowledge is to be brought nearer to the personality of the great genius than could be done by any amount of ordinary bibliographical work. During the Paris and London residencies, which stretched from early fall 1860 to late spring 1861, the indefatigable Thayer spent countless hours traveling, writing, interviewing, and corresponding showing yet again that he prized the recollections of those who had met Beethoven and that he was determined to interview, in person or otherwise, the living intimates of the great composer. In the longer view, however, this new documentary evidence helps to construct a hitherto unwritten chapter in the life of Thayer, Beethoven's most important biographer. Thank you very much. Thank you.